All right, guys. So the British media are reporting on this very disturbing case today. And I'd like to say this case is unusual in its abhorrence, in its neglect. But sadly, I can't say that because time and time again, we see the authorities failing children. And we see parents who are prepared to be horrendously abusive. And in some of those cases, such as this one, that horrific abuse is fatal. Now, I'm reading this from the Mail Online because they've got a a detailed write-up of this case. It happened in 2020, but the case has just gone to court. Why did they walk away? Social workers visited baby Finlay Borden's mess-strewn home two days before parents beat him to death, but didn't insist on seeing him, even when they spotted his mother buying drugs. What in the world were these people thinking? I feel I should give a trigger warning. I know this is true crime, and some of the cases that we view are just horrendous and just I, I don't have words to describe how abusive this situation was but yeah this is a little baby a little tiny baby and it seems that there's some blame of lockdown going on this was covid times I don't know how much we can blame this neglect on lockdown quite honestly But Finlay Borden suffered a catalogue of appalling injuries before his death in 2020. Stephen Borden and Shannon Marsden, his parents, were convicted today at Derby Crown Court. So this is in England. Derby is in the Midlands, somewhere in England. Social workers visited two days before death of baby Finlay, but didn't see him. Social workers trying desperately to see baby Finley before his tragic death were turned away by his drug-using father at the door just two days before he was murdered by his parents. Stephen Bowden, 30, and Shannon Marsden, 22, murdered 10-month-old Finley Bowden on Christmas Day. Christmas Day. His first Christmas. And they murdered him during lockdown. Now, if I remember rightly, we weren't on full lockdown here in the UK uh, by Christmas. There were some special dispensations in Christmas that you were allowed to see members of your family and stuff like that. We weren't on full lockdown. I'm sick. I'm fed up of people using COVID lockdown as an excuse for abuse. I'm fed up of it. Now, look, guys, I'm not saying that lockdown didn't have an effect on people's mental health and on the way they work. I'm not saying that because it did. But still, I cannot allow to even think that people didn't do their jobs properly and parents murdered their child just because of lockdown. I think that is an excuse. I'm not having it. Just listen to this. Just listen to this. He suffered 130 appalling injuries, 71 bruises, 57 fractures, crushed and twisted bones. And in the hours after his death, Father Stephen Borden joked about selling his pushchair on eBay, later telling police he was trying to lighten the mood. So lightening the mood after murdering your baby son. Social workers had raised concerns before Finley was even born due to concerns over the state of the family home and his parents' drug use. So why didn't they act? This is baby Finley. This is who we are talking about. He was removed from their care immediately after he was born in February 2020. So why didn't he stay gone in foster care? Why wasn't he adopted by a family? who would love and care for him in the way that any child deserves. Why? Why was he returned in November? So he'd spent his entire life from February till November in safety, 
and then he was returned to his parents. Well, what had changed? Had they become fine, upstanding members of the community by this time? How are we blaming lockdown for this? Social workers saw the vulnerable child for the last time on November 27th, despite numerous further visits. During the final visit on December 23rd, Borden came to the front door and said the child was asleep because he was not very well. So wasn't this a red flag? Wasn't this a red flag? I'm sure it was. I'm sure the individuals concerned were wanting to see baby Finlay and did have those concerns. Well, what did they do to try to get into that home? Couldn't they have called the cops or something? I I don't know, guys. It beggars belief. And then he closed the door in a social worker's face as his partner at Marsden was buying drugs down the road. Doesn't that necessitate a call to the police? Am I being naive here, guys? Am I being too harsh? I don't know what to tell you. Right, they see Marsden buying drugs, an illegal act. That's that's the excuse they need to call the cops and get baby Finley out of there. But no, they didn't, and then he was murdered. So these are some images from their home. But they're buying drugs, them saying he's not very well. <laughs> Come on, guys. On November 17th, Finley was allowed to live permanently with Marsden and Borden, having been removed from the couple just days after his birth, despite evidence of his parents' drug use as late as September 2020. So they were still using drugs and they returned him. They didn't act when they saw his mother buying drugs in their presence down the road from where they were. A number of social workers and health workers then visited the home address, but on more than one occasion were unable to enter the property. A home visit on November 19th found a four centimetre bump on Finley's forehead, which his parents blamed on an accident with a toy. Well, yeah, I guess kids have accidents. One social worker confirmed to the court on November 2022 that the last time she had seen baby Finley alive was November 27th when he was asleep on the sofa while the couple listened to music upstairs. The defendants had not opened the door and the social worker was forced to observe the child through a window. So they saw him alive, but they didn't actually go in. They just looked through the window. Well, how do they know he was asleep? How do they know he wasn't unconscious? How do they know he hadn't been beaten to within an inch of his life? How did they know that, observing him through a window? During the December 2023rd visit, the social worker said Borden shut the door in her face. Now, this is baby Finley's last moments, hours before he was murdered on Christmas Day. This is a surveillance video of Borden coming out or into a store with baby Finley in the pram. This is just hours before he was murdered. And there he is, the ever-loving father with his son, the son that he beat to death. A feeding bottle found at the home of mould growing on the inside. Well, there's messy and then there's just downright disgusting. While leaving, the social worker saw Marsden leaving a car just 100 yards away after an exchange that looked like a drug deal. She explained at trial that the council's view on the couple's persistent drug use was that it needed to be safe. It wasn't safe for Finley, though, was it? So they're excusing drug use as long as it's safe. Well, it wasn't safe, was it? One parent would take care of the child while the other went to collect drugs and vice versa. The worker told the court there was a concern that Stephen and Shannon were using cannabis as a strategy to deal with emotions. Well, maybe they were using a whole lot more. (laughs) Something went very, very, very wrong, didn't it? The concern was having small children can be stressful at times. The worry was that they would continue to use cannabis to cope with stress. (sighs) 
On Christmas Eve, Finlay was seen alive for the last time when he was out with his parents in Chesterfield before he was killed on Christmas Day, just 39 days after he was returned to their care. I say again, why was he returned? Why? This has shades of Harmony Montgomery from um, New Hampshire in the US. Exactly the same thing happened in Harmony's case. Oakley Carlson, another one, who was safe, who was in a loving foster home, and she was returned. And Oakley has never been found. Harmony's body never been found. Child Safeguard and Review into the circumstances surrounding Finlay's death is currently underway. Sir Peter Wanless, NSPCC Chief Executive, so that's the National Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children here in the UK, demanded a child safeguarding practice review to provide answers as soon as possible. He said the suffering of Finlay, inflicted by the very people who should have been caring for him, was harrowing and difficult to comprehend. That is an understatement. The death of a child in such brutal circumstances leaves many of us asking questions and we await the child safeguarding practice review to provide answers as soon as possible. I can provide you the answers. People didn't do their jobs. People weren't insistent enough. People thought it was acceptable to see a child through a window and mark that off as okay. A mother buying drugs down the road and that's acceptable, that's okay, oh, as long as it's safe. Well, it wasn't safe, was it? <sighs> Finlay was one of 36 children who died in England following abuse and maltreatment at home in 2020 alone. That is 36 children too many. 36 children too many when there are people willing to foster and adopt children. Am I asking too much here? Am I? Seriously. Look at him. Who? Who could murder an innocent little face like that? How many people would be willing to take a baby and look after him and adopt him? Come on, guys. Look at these two. Absolute law lives. Absolute, complete law lives. The last time Finley was pictured alive at Chesterfield Marketplace on Christmas Eve, so just hours before he died. He said, so that children who are at most risk are protected, it is vital the government takes forward the changes recommended by previous reviews and experts to transform the child protection system and ensure the different agencies involved are able to work together effectively to focus on children and babies like Finlay. We have these safeguarding practices. The problem is people aren't doing their jobs properly. That's the problem. People are too willing to say, oh, yeah, tick box, Jay was alive. And I know social workers are overworked. I get it. But what I don't get is when they don't force the issue. That's what I don't get. And then the ultimate horror happens. Don Carrington, a child rights expert and abuse survivor, said, It's horrifying and unfathomable to me that poor baby Finley was put back in the hands of his killers by Chesterfield Social Services to suffer such torture and horror which led to his tragic death. Not only that, but two days before his murder, his father reportedly demonstrated aggressive behaviour towards social services on their final attempt to check on Finlay, which was evidently not followed up. <laughs> Absolutely. We've heard over and over how the death of baby P, Peter Conley, and the media storm at the time had a lasting impact on child protection. However, despite there being grave concerns for Finlay's safety, he was returned to the care of his depraved abusers. She called upon the Prime Minister to introduce a new task force to tackle child abuse. Well, hell will freeze over before the Prime Minister will do anything. Hell will freeze over. 
Without stronger protections, there will be many more baby Finleys who are heartbreakingly placed back into the hands of abusers to either lose their life or suffer continued abuse. CCTV images show Bowden pushing the baby boy in a pram hours before the murder, which saw the evil couple break his pelvis in two with sustained kicking or stamping and inflict burns on his hand, one from a hot flat surface, the other from a cigarette flame. The child developed pneumonia, endocarditis, which is inflammation of the heart, and sepsis. The trial judge, Mrs Justice Tipples, choked back tears today when thanking the jury for their verdicts. Little Finlay fatally collapsed after suffering a cardiac arrest. Paramedics were called at 2.33am on Christmas Day and he was pronounced dead at the hospital at 3.45am. His parents did not call an ambulance for an hour because Borden wanted to smoke cannabis and hide their drugs. Police released pictures of Finlay and his killer parents for the first time on Friday and the squalid conditions in which he spent his final days with faeces in the bedroom. He slept on a vomit and faeces stained cot that was crammed against the side of his parents' bed. Just hours after his son's death, Borden was heard telling Marsden at hospital that he was going to sell Finlay's pushchair on eBay. He sent a text message two days before the child's death saying, I want to bounce him off the walls. Why didn't he give his kid up then? Why did he want his kid back? Why didn't he give his kid up? Why? So there's a little box here. There's a little bit more about the uh, conditions of the home. How Finley endured a short life of squalor after being returned to care of his parents. Images released by police show the grim conditions Finley endured in his short life with his parents. Clutter is seen throughout the home with unwashed pots and pans piled up in the kitchen, toys and bags carelessly thrown into the bathtub and a bedside table littered with dirty cigarette butts and empty cans of energy drink. Meanwhile, a feeding bottle appears to have mould growing on the inside and a number of stains are visible on the bed sheet. Medics discovered Bowden trying to resuscitate Finley on the kitchen floor but also noticed that the youngster's clothing was dirty, had dirty hands and fingernails and he had new and raw scrapes and abrasions on his nose and the linings of his nostrils. Little Finlay becomes the latest victim in the harrowing roll call of children killed in their homes in lockdown, including Star Hobson, Arthur Labinho Hughes and Logan Mwangi. Look, guys, I say again, there were things put in place during lockdown to help people do their work. I can't blame lockdown for this. I know the added pressures and stuff like that. I, I, I can't excuse. I can't excuse people not doing that. I can't. Not given the amount of red flags. No. I'm sorry. No. The inside of Finley's mouth was torn with Miss Pryor saying this is caused by forcing a dummy or bottle in the mouth. The baby had a spiral break to a thigh while a shin bone break was consistent with being held by the ankle and gripped and twisted. Detective Inspector Steve Shaw of Derbyshire Constabulary said the boy's bones were crushed and twisted during a campaign of abuse. During the case, D.I. Shaw said... The appearance of Finlay at the time of his death was generally showing signs that he had been neglected. Officers went to the house on Holland Road where they lived and they found squalid living conditions. Filthy bedding, filthy clothing, rotting food in the kitchen, no environment to bring a child up in. And there were signs of cannabis abuse scattered about the house. I don't think that prepared us for the level of injury that we discovered when the post-mortem took place. The majority of Finley's bones were fractured in some way and as the investigation progressed, the evidence from some experts around the levels of force that have been used, Finley's bones have been crushed and twisted with quite some force, eliminating any accidental cause of these injuries. 57 fractures, 45 to the ribs, several burns and 71 bruises in the weeks prior to his death. Look, guys, he'd only been returned to them in November. So all of this has occurred in, what, just over a month? 
He had a broken shoulder, broken arm, broken shin bone, a thigh bone broken in four places and a pelvis broken in two places. How did this little boy survive so long? The police investigation, which took a year before charges were brought, compiled evidence from burn experts, paediatricians and pathologists, which concluded that the injuries were deliberately inflicted. Despite the couple's bail conditions forbidding contact, they continued a sexual relationship. They only split up for good when they were both charged with murder and both then tried to blame the other for their child's death. Further inquiries revealed that drug use and domestic abuse were themes of Borden and Marsden's relationship in the months and weeks prior to Finley's murder, although Finley was returned to them. D.I. Shaw said that while you can't dispute there is an element of domestic abuse in the pair's relationships, both had to be complicit in what was happening. Despite what happened at that address on that day when Shannon and Stephen were released on bail, initially with conditions not to contact each other, why were they given bail? Within a couple of weeks, they had resumed their relationship and they continued with that relationship until they were arrested again, both charged and placed in prison. Even whilst they were in prison, they were writing affectionate letters to each other. And so, while clearly this relationship had quite toxic elements in the fact that the couple would argue it could be disruptive and certainly a poor environment to raise any child, there was, in my view, quite strong elements of codependency on each other. This is taking into account the Holland Road address where they lived was in a squalid state and a small property for a family. So both parties had to be complicit and have knowledge of what was going on within that tiny space. Of course they did. Of course they did. Borden later claimed to a relative the family dog may have jumped on Finlay, causing broken ribs. What, 40 odd fractures to his ribs? What, a dog? Are you blaming your dog now? You blaming your dog now? Right, okay, blame the dog. Why not? Whilst allegedly blaming marks on Finley's mouth on his son hitting himself with a rattle. He told another relative the pair did not call an ambulance for an hour because he wanted to have a cannabis joint and hide the drug stash. Marsden was 17 and Borden was 24 when they first met and enjoyed smoking cannabis together. Returned to the couple's care over eight weeks by a court order in October 2020, despite social workers asking for a longer transition. Why transition him at all to living with them? Why? They clearly didn't want him. They clearly weren't capable of looking after him. Clearly, they were in no fit state. Why was he returned? Borden of Romford Way in Chesterfield and Marsden of no fixed address are denied murder, two counts of child cruelty and two charges of causing or allowing the death of a child. Prosecutor Mary Pryor QC described how Finlay suffered a catalogue of appalling injuries as we've seen. The couple surprised officers when the topic of conversation in the police car following the tragedy was what the food was for Christmas Day and on Boxing Day they were heard at a relative's house laughing and joking. The parents were said to have prioritised getting money to spend on cannabis over their baby's care. Miss Pryor said earlier in the trial his parents, we say, worked together to hide the injuries from social workers, from health, the health visitor and from the police for their own self-centred reasons. Toxicology reports show that baby Finley had cannabis in his bloodstream at the time of his death and must have been exposed to smoke in the 24 hours preceding the tragedy. So here's a timeline. September 20th, 2019, Marsden informs social care she's 20 weeks pregnant with Finlay. October 2019, social care begins court proceedings in relation to the unborn child. January 16th, 2020, social workers visit the couple's address finding holes in the bedroom door. 21st of January, unborn Finlay is made a subject to a child protection plan. February 15th, 2020, Finlay is born. February 18th, Finlay leaves hospital and is removed from the couple's care. February 25th, Borden and Marsden tell social workers they want Finlay back. And then October 1st, Family Court directs Finlay should be returned to the care of his parents under an eight-week plan, including unsupervised visits and overnight stays of varying durations. November 17th, Finlay is allowed to live permanently with his parents. 
19th, new social worker visits the home. 20th, health visitor visits the address. 26th, health visitor tries to call Marsden, but there's no answer. 27th, social worker makes an announced visit to home. 29th, Borden and Marsden record video and pictures of Finlay on their phone. 23rd of December, social worker visits the property but is unable to go inside. 24th, Finlay is seen alive for the last time as he's taken out by his parents in Chesterfield. Christmas Day, Finlay is murdered. But in November, they hadn't actually seen Finlay, like, properly, had they? Like, asleep through a window is not properly, not properly seeing him, is it? The trial previously heard chilling text messages sent from the parents' joint mobile phone. One message from that handset to her contact saved a smoky jay. At 12.39pm on December 23rd says, Little one, effing kept me up all night. I want to bounce him off the walls. Ha ha. Before the youngster was returned to the couple's care by a court order, internet searches were made on that phone for several news articles relating to parent-involved child deaths. Why? On October 15th, 2020, so this is before Finlay goes back to live with them, a record was found of a BBC story about a father jailed for killing two-month-old son. What, were they planning to kill him and get away with it? Is that what they were planning? Why? Why? On another, on the same day, brought up an article about a mother charged with killing 20-month-old daughter through neglect. And then he's returned. November 17th, the date Finley was returned to the couple's care. Similar internet searches were carried out. Then again on December 7th. On December 6th, the phone was used to search Does anyone know if there's a woman's refuge in Chesterfield? So was Marsden trying to get out? Of the relationship? Well, why did she continue a relationship with him then? Six days later, shortly before 5am, text messages which the Crown has said were written by Marsden were sent to one of her relatives. The messages read by Prosecution Barrister Sally Hobson said, I apologise for waking you. I didn't know what else to do. It was either you or the police and Stephen didn't want Finley in the house. Well, why didn't she get him out of that house then? If she cared about him so much, if Stephen was so abusive, why did she not act on it? I ain't doing it anymore. I wanted a nice, happy family Christmas, but that's not going to happen here. The phone was shortly thereafter used to search for emergency housing. Mum and kids Chesterfield, the court heard. But yet, she didn't contact social workers. Well... Was he stopping her from doing that? Maybe. Maybe. Further messages read, he couldn't give two shits if I were still here or not. I don't think he wants this family anymore. Then get Finley out of there then. On December 12th, 2020, Marsden is said to have sent the following text to another relative. Me and Stephen have done nothing but argue all night. He's not bothered about us at all. He told me to get out of the house this morning at 4.30am because Finley was crying and I'm not going to risk neighbours getting involved and risk losing Finley. I need to get out. I've stuck around so many times thinking things will get better. It never does. It never will. She later said, Stephen will never see these kids again. After I'm done. What, these kids? There's more than one kid. Well, where, where are the other kids then? Where are the other kids? The jury then heard how the same phone was used to send a message which the Crown has suggested was Bowen, which read, Effing been up all night, little one has been ill as F. Why? Because you've been beating him? I bet. The next day, he said to have sent another message to a suspected drug dealer which read, just kid and missus doing my nut, need a smart bad, ha ha. Well, why didn't he get out then? Why didn't he get out? If he hated them so much, why didn't he leave? Come on now. On December 14th, a message this time, said to be from Marsden, was sent to a relative which read, I'm deleting this after I've sent it, but please have the baby before Friday. Make an excuse or something, please. I need him at yours so I can do what I need to. 
However, the next morning, nine days before Finley's death, a text to the same number read, I'm deleting this after I've sent it, so don't answer, but you're not having him tomorrow. I think no one is seeing Finley right now. Why? Because he was so injured? Probably. In the next 24 hours, another three internet news searches were done on the phone, bringing up articles, including one about a Derby mum who killed her baby and another about a child who was killed because he cried too much. On December 21st, days before Finlay's fatal collapse, Marsden is said to have messaged another relative saying, get the police to mine, tell them I'm scared of Stephen around the baby. He just hit me again, tell them he'll kill me. He just tried, please, I will be dead, not joking. Well, what did the relatives do about it? Were the police called? She's, she's calling out for help here. Were the police called? Like if she couldn't get out of her own volition? What did what did the relatives do about it? I'm like, I'm, I'm in beggar's belief. This child has been failed by every single person in his life. The trial also heard evidence from social worker Jennifer Hancock, who recounted details of a half-hour telephone conversation she had with Marsden on February 11th, 2021. The call took place after both parents had already been initially arrested and released on conditional bail not to contact one another, while police investigations into Finley's death were continuing. Marsden sent a text to Mrs Hancock asking her to ring, which the local authority worker immediately did. Miss Pryor asked the witness what Marsden's manner was during the call, to which she replied she was irate, distressed, shouting, talking at great speed and swearing at me. Mrs Hancock claimed she was asked by Marsden to pass on a message to another male family member telling the social worker, tell him the full-on truth. Mrs Hancock added Marsden then alleged Borden killed Finlay and that she didn't see it coming. She did see it coming though, didn't she? She was asking for help from people. She did see it coming. Marsden allegedly said Finlay was beaten to death. Well... Yeah, in the most horrific way possible. Marsden also claimed in the call that Borden was in contact with other women, telling one of them she, Marsden, was dead. Also told his partner he was going to leave in the days before Finley's death. Why didn't he then? Miss Pryor asked the social worker, did she, Marsden, say anything else to you about Mr Borden? Mrs Hancock said she did. When pregnant with Finlay, which was unexpected, he told her to do what you like. The Crown's QC then asked, did she tell you anything about how Mr Borden spoke about Finlay? She replied, she told me he killed his own son and that she was annoyed and stated Mr Borden has said to police he might have done it, he can't remember. I just can't anymore. So those are the text messages. Mrs Hancock said she continued supporting Marsden after her son's death, contacting the GP about her mental health, making regular check-ins and also inquiring about getting her help as a possible victim of domestic abuse. Well, it's too late for Finley by this time, isn't it? Too little, too late. We were concerned about whether there was domestic abuse. Oh, you're concerned now. All right, then. She was referred through as high risk and allocated an independent domestic high risk advocate. They speak about safety plans. If somebody needs to go into a refuge, help them and just generally make sure the person is supported if they wanted to report incidents. Well, perhaps she wanted to report incidents before Finley was murdered. How about that? Marsden and Borden will be sentenced on May 26. Well, I hope. They go down for life. They've both denied killing, charges of murder and manslaughter, but were found guilty after a week-long deliberation, after a five-week trial. A week-long deliberation. Seems an open and shut case to me. As judge, Mrs Justice Tipples addressed the jury, four were in tears. All members of the jury have been excused from taking part in jury service again for life due to the incredibly distressing nature of this case. But yet it took them a week to deliberate. OK, then. Mrs Justice Tipple said, Given the length of the case and the awful nature of the facts you have had to consider, I discharge you from jury service for life. 
And then they go on to talk about heartbreaking roll call of children who became victims of lockdown. They weren't victims of lockdown. Yes, lockdown's a contributor to the stress and stuff and to changing working patterns. But I'm sorry, the world had to carry on. I'm not having it. I'm not having it. It's an excuse. It's an excuse. It's an excuse for all concerned. All right, guys, let me know what you think in the comments. Have I been too harsh? Have I not been harsh enough? I'm just so sick, so sick and tired of children losing their lives when adults just simply either don't care, don't do their jobs, or are just downright monsters. That's it.